Welcome to Steel Town. I'm your host, Kelly Fedor, and in this episode, From a Twear to a Tap Hole, we'll look at the Blast Furnace and the people who run it, how they not only form the backbone of the business, but also set up the nation for success. But first, let's go back to when GFG Alliance purchased the whale as Steelworks. In 2017, steelmaker Sanjeev Gupta walked through the gates and saw an opportunity. Tracy Sen has part one of our interview with GFG's chairman. Your passion for steel, where did that come from? The easy answer is that I was born with it. When I was a kid, my father, my grandfather were in the steel business. I remember my earliest memory is of running around steel mills and seeing hot metal being poured and you know being inspired by that and being awestruck about that. But I think fundamentally in terms of as, I, as, as I've grown up, what uh, I believe in very passionately is uh, evolution. And I believe that, uh, I hope and I dream that humanity will, will be eternal. And that requires for us to constantly evolve. But you know, all of that steel is fundamental. We can, couldn't have steel, civilization without steel. And every aspiration we have, whether it's to go to the go to the stars or or do anything, every sing, single thing in life uh, is based on steel. And I also recognize that uh, that has cost the planet something which we didn't really understand until until recently, but now we do. And steel is the the biggest polluter of all. So obviously, these two ambitions: one for evolution and progress in technology, and at the same time. Uh, wanting to make sure that we're not destroying our planet uh, are incongruous and we have to find a solution. And hence now, my passion is basically very much focused on green steel and a decarbonized version of this incredible commodity which has built civilization. Look, it hasn't been, I guess, the easiest of journeys. Somehow, sometimes you've said that business was losing a million dollars a day when you acquired it. You managed to get that back up into the black and now there's more external challenges facing um, the business in the global markets. Can you talk a bit about that and how you see the business moving forward? Uh, just We just completed seven years uh, since uh, we acquired the business in Australia, since, since GFG bought um, the RM business out of administration. And it's certainly been... Uh, a roller coaster. We had, although we started in a very, very difficult moment, but nonetheless, we had relative success in the beginning. Uh, it was a lot of effort. In the first three, four years, we managed to bring the business almost to black. And uh, then we got hit by multiple tsunamis. We got hit by COVID to begin with, then the collapse of green cell, then oversupply, Chinese economy coming off the boil. And one after another after another, we've, hit, we've been hit with the uh, obstacles and blows. But it hasn't shaken our resolve. I mean, I'm used to struggle. This town is used to struggle. This this steel works are used to struggle. So I, I I hope we will, you know, everybody will keep their faith and will persevere. There is a destination. It will take time. It will take effort. It will take ups and downs. But in the meantime, what is more important now, which I'm really focused on, is that we need to get our day-to-day -day business. I need to get a house in order. So our day-to-day -day business. We have a good blast furnace. There's nothing wrong with this blast furnace. There's a lot of naysayers which say the blast furnace is the end of life. It's not true. It's a good modern blast furnace. And uh, with the right strategy and with the right management, it will, it will prosper. It, I'm not going to lie and say that it's going to make lots of money, but we can stem the losses. We can eradicate the losses, maybe even turn it slightly profitable. If we can achieve that, then it's an achievement because other parts of our business in Australia are making money and will continue to make money. What Wireless Steelworks needs to do is stop losing money, and that's my primary and key goal now, and I believe we'll achieve that. What does running the blast furnace full mean for the community of Wyala? It's a very good question. This is a steel town. It's dependent on the steelworks. And the supply chain, I all often say it's one in 10 jobs in the steelworks, or any steelworks, any integrated steelworks, there is another 10 jobs outside what job exists inside. So if we are fully deployed and fully employed, if our workforce is fully deployed and employed, we're running all the shifts, we're doing everything, everyone's working all the time, everyone's in the plants, not at home, then that means that there will also mean contractors and the entire supply chain comes into action as well. And hence, it brings you know the energy and the uh, vocation back to the community as well. I'm not suggesting it's gonna be a piece of cake or it's gonna be uh, easy because to turn this business from its current losses to profit is gonna be a Herculean task, but we will achieve it. And the derivative of that will be that there'll be more work for, for the town. Sanjeev, tough year for also for the Blast Furnace team. Have you got a message for those guys who've been working very, very hard over um, a number of months now to, to get the Blast Furnace back up and running to full? Yeah, I've never seen a, a Blast Furnace operation have so much trouble as we've had this year. So my heart really goes out 
to the team. I mean, trying to restart a blast furnace and sort of, you know, taking two steps forward and then getting pushed back again. It is very disheartening, but I, I, I commend their courage. They keep, you know, they get up and go again and keep going and keep going. You know, I was at the blast furnace now and you keep lancing and you keep lancing and eventually you will succeed. So it requires a lot of patience, perseverance. Uh, um, they know, as do I, that the blast furnace is now in a good shape and it will come back. So they're waiting for that day when it's running properly and they can show and they can prove to the community, they can prove to the world, there's nothing wrong with this blast furnace. It's a good blast furnace. I'm looking forward to that day as much for them as I am for myself. Uh, it will come soon. And just finally, a message to the people of Wyala. What have you got to say to them um, today, Sanjeev? I have a message, which is basically saying that there is plenty of naysayers. There was always have been. Long before I arrived, there were naysayers and there are plenty now again. Whenever there is trouble, there is naysayers. And they only get oxygen because we indulge them. And if we don't indulge them, if we keep the faith, then they don't get oxygen to, be, to basically talk about the failure of the steelworks, talk about the failure of the town, to talk about collapse. Their oxygen is coming from us. We need to, we need to keep our faith. And this town is not going anywhere. The steelworks is not going anywhere. Liberty is not going anywhere. We will continue making steel here for the next it has made steel for 60 years, we'll make steel for 60 years and beyond in the future. For now, we need to focus on making this blast furnace run. That's our primary target. In due course, green steel will come. But we need a lot of things to happen, to fall into line before that happens reality. And the biggest thing which I keep saying to everybody is, people keep saying, well, why aren't you building a you know, DRI plant? Why aren't you building an arc furnace? You said you would. This is not based on coal. We cannot just bring coal in as we've been doing for the blast furnace or coke in and, and build a steel plant. This needs a gas. It needs gas which needs to be brought in. We don't have currently hydrogen. And even for natural gas, we don't even have the infrastructure to have enough natural gas coming in. Now, I'm not trying to be skeptical because uh, we're discussing, having deep discussion with the South Australian government. And I believe with this talk about a new lateral for gas, and I believe that will happen. And when that happens, then we at least have natural gas. And that can be a, give us a kickstart in terms of uh, building a DRI plant. And a DRI plant and electric arc furnace are coupled because there is not enough scrap in uh, Wyala to basically build or run an electric arc furnace based on scrap. And it would be a tragedy anyway. The reason the steel works are here is because the mining is here. And that's our future. So we need to build an iron plant, not just run on scrap. So the DRI plant will come. There are plenty of investors willing to invest. The world needs green iron, but we need a solution for energy. That energy solution the government is working on. And uh, as and when that happens, we can also progress our plans. So we have aligned our plans for the DRI and the EF to be, to be lo in lockstep with the government's uh, plans for energy. Yes, as long as they deliver, we will be able to progress our plans for DRI and EIF as well. But that is the future. And I think, of course, I am the one, I'm the first one to get super excited about the future and uh, live those dreams. But that's perhaps taken our eye off the ball in terms of the immediate term. Right now, we need to focus on today. We need to focus on running our plan full so that we have, everybody has vocation, everybody has work to do, and we stop stem our losses so that we have a future. We'll bring you part two of that interview next time. As Sanjeev said, until our transition to green iron and steel, Wyala relies on its blast furnace and the team who operate it. John Ortlieb introduces us to some of those workers. You're listening to the engine room of the steelworks. At about 1500 degrees, the blast furnace is hotter than magma in the volcano. This hot, dirty and challenging environment is the workplace of some of the most skilled workers. Hi, I'm Matt Middleton. I'm a blast furnace process engineer at the blast furnace at the Wyala Steelworks. And yeah, I've been here 28 years. Matthew is on the ground getting the blast furnace back to normal operation. He says he's never heard the word twir so commonly used. Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, twir was a pretty foreign word um, to a lot of people uh, a little while ago, but it's a, yeah, I, I can't believe that you walk down the street and someone says, how many twirs open? How does a blast furnace work? Right, so blast furnace is basically a, a steel cylinder uh, that is full of raw materials and we blast air, a superheated air in the bottom through nozzles called twirs and that hot blast combusts the coke that's in there, which is carbon, and uh, creates a chemical uh, reaction that reduces the iron ore to iron. And then the iron and the slag, which uh, holds the impurities, that comes out or settles in the bottom, which is called the hearth of the furnace. And then it comes out the tap hole when we open up the tap hole for a cast. 
The challenge to get the blast furnace going is one the team is meeting head on. The process of starting the furnace can be quite frustrating at times, but um, yeah, the, the resilience of iron makers is incredible. Um, we just don't want to give up. We want to get this furnace back and we want to make iron because that's what we do. William Cunningham is the Blast Furnace Manager. I've been in, in uh, Blast Furnace operations for, for almost three decades now and um, you just keep on learning. Um, it is really, for me, it's a fulfilling uh, job to have. William says the team is working as hard and safely as possible. When you do just get it going again and you get the tap hole open, well, what's that feeling like? Oh, it's just it's just a wonderful feeling. I think it's um, because because you work so hard for it um, to get uh, to get the furnace going from from a, a standstill um, is an absolute uh, huge um, um, set of activities that's required, and uh, to see that first uh, liquids flowing out the tap hole is just a marvelous thing to see. Because the moment uh, we always say when a furnace works. Uh, the crew's going to waste a bit, so yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Adrian Fawkes. I've worked at the uh, site here at Wyala for 35 years plus, currently the engineering leader at the Blast Furnace. So it is important, I think, the town understands the, the process a little bit more than what it has in the past, and understanding that it's not just a matter of switching more tweers on effectively. It's, it's a much longer process, it's a drawn-out process, uh, and it's a really one step at a time process. When you see that hot iron, molten iron coming out, do you have any concept of where that goes and, and that, what that builds in our nation? And does that invoke a little bit of pride in you know, all the hard work you do? It does actually, yeah. yeah. And, I, and if I've looked around, at, uh, you know, and it might be a, a warehouse or a, a museum actually, uh, that's made of structural steel and I'll tell, tell my wife, we rolled that. <laughs> she rolls her eyes then, but, then, but anyway, yes, I do have a lot of pride in, in Whaler Old Product. Danielle Bateman is the Community and Stakeholder Coordinator. We spoke to her about the team's dedication to the Whaler people. What sort of programs do we support around the Whaler community? Uh, well, I guess with our financial support through the GFD Alliance Community Support Program. Uh, the categories that we have through there are community groups and events, which covers ones like the uh, the Christmas pageant, carols, um, the Wyla show, that sort of thing, and then a disadvantage, so food bank, um, the Smith family and the like. Indigenous, we have a partnership with the Shooting Stars and then cover things like NAIDOC Week. Um, with the Shooting Stars, we were really honoured earlier this year. We um, host them in our Adelaide corporate office each year when they have their leadership camp. And we were able to, this year, take the girls to a, um AFL game, which was a heritage round. So it was really great being able to um, bring them to an event where they could witness the official welcome to country and smoking ceremony, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have in the program diversity and inclusion and then um, a lot of youth, arts, development, education and sport as well. Um, and then ones that aren't financial are more like the uh, Wyala Hope program. We get involved with the Christmas relief and then you know there's other working groups like the Christmas on the Avenue, that sort of thing as well. Why is this support of the community and the people of Wyala so important to the business? I think as the largest employer in Wyala, um, it's not just supporting our own people, it's supporting the community as a whole. Uh, but it, it does give, we don't just want to be the largest employer, we want to be part of the community. And that's a, just a genuine feel from the business that our participation in the in the community and whether that's financial or with our resources like our people, that's our that's our aim. You're involved in this work every day. How does the community support impact you personally? Uh, this is by far um, an amazing role for me to have. Our, the impact that we have on the community is is really rewarding, um, and the fact that you know I can spend a day out at Iron Knob with some of the residents out there, and and they just they just come to have a chat really and. And you can see what what you bring to them, and then to be part of another program in Wyla, you know, the following day, it's it's seeing what we can do for them um, that yeah makes it so rewarding.
You may not realise that Wyala is the only producer of rail in Australia and is a key supplier in many major nation building projects. Let's talk to Daniel Coglin, who leads the sales of this high quality Australian steel. Hi Kelly, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, listen, um, the list is almost endless. Um, if you go anywhere in Australia, you're going to find our product. Um, you're probably travelling on it. Um, you know, the rail network right around Australia is built out of uh, rail produced in uh, Wyala. And so, yeah, to and from work, to and from, uh, you know, marquee events at sporting stadiums all around Australia, Optus Stadium in Perth, the MCG, the SCG, uh, Country Bank Stadium in Townsville, Combank Stadium in Parramatta. All those facilities are built with a significant uh, contribution of Liberty Steel. Uh, and of course, yeah, you, you get to and from those places of entertainment on on rail that was yeah proudly made in uh, in Wyala. Um, and then there's the more bespoke type yeah projects that we're involved in, marquee ones that you might see. Um, you know, if you're up in Byron Bay and you went to the Cape Byron Lighthouse, um, there's a now a, a small cafe that's built on the side of uh, the lighthouse. There has magnificent views of um, of Watergoes Beach and Clark's Beach and back into Byron Bay. And if you look carefully enough, um, all the the columns holding up the roof of that that cafe have our um, have our rolled in mark. So that's where Wyala product has ended up as well. And then if you um, if if you're lucky enough to go to Australia Zoo, it's probably on the bucket list of every child in Australia to visit Australia Zoo um, and see the crocodiles and and uh, and visit Bindi's Treehouse, which is one of the real marquee kind of uh, places within Australia Zoo. Uh, as you walk into Bindi's treehouse, which is beautiful, and you walk through the walkway and start to go up the steps into the treehouse, there's a beam that's holding up the first floor of that treehouse and our rolled in marks right in the middle of that beam. The men and women of Wayala must get a lot of pride from working on these projects that impact the everyday lives of Australians. They do and they should. Um, you know, I'm one of these weird people um, and and my family have a laugh every time we travel around um, around Australia, um, that I'm the I'm the guy who's you know in a train station or is in a shopping centre or is in a building, and I'm looking up at, at the beams and I'm looking to see if they're our steel in those beams. So we look for I'm one of these uh, spotters of our rolled in mark all around Australia, and I'm very proud of it. How much hard work from these workers goes into producing what then becomes a mega project? That's a good question, and it's an incredible process, you know, to um, produce steel. Um, from iron or coal, um, you know, pig iron and take that through steel making, uh, refine it into the high quality grades that are required to make products like steel rail. Um, the process of rolling, re-rolling that rail from a, from a bloom, um, you know, through the rolling mill, through finishing ends, uh, lots of various quality checks. And then, you know, even the the skills that are required in handling that product. Um, you know, rail traditionally is um, 27 and a half metres long. And so that doesn't sound too much when you're talking about it, but obviously when you see it, 27 and a half metres long, you know, it's you know, double the width of a standard house block or something like that. So, uh, yeah, just the skills required and the logistics in moving that rail to where it needs to be in Australia uh, is incredible. And, and the people here, work incredibly hard. From opportunity to finished mega projects and the people that make it happen, I hope we've given you a little bit of an insight into the wonderful world of steelmaking in Wyala. As always, our workers' welfare is the number one priority, so we will finish with a safety note. Hi, my name is Jasmine Stevens. I'm a safety specialist at the Wireless Steelworks and my safety takeaway is to stay focused on the task at hand. Distractions can lead to dangerous mistakes. Join us next time for another episode of Steel Town. <laughs>